Uh, hey everyone, welcome to Talks at Google. My name is Dana Heinklein, and today it is my pleasure to introduce Jack Horner, paleontologist and professor at Montana State University. Uh, he is a consultant on the Jurassic Park franchise and was a consultant on this latest one, Jurassic World. Welcome. Thank you. So you've been with the series from the beginning. In fact, part of your works inspired the series, correct? That's what they say. That's what they say. Um, so wh what's it been like to be sort of evolved from this role of being an inspiration for it? You know, they say that part of the character of Alan Grant is based on your work um, to becoming this sort of influencing factor on the science behind it. Okay. <laughs> I don't know what to say about it. I, I'm glad my character hasn't been eaten. <laughs> Survival is good. Survival is right. definitely good. Um, well, let, you know, it's been the the novel came out in 1990, and the first film came out in 1993, and we've seen a lot of developments in the field of paleontology since then. You know, we've we've learned a lot about dinosaurs since then. Um, what are some of the things? You know, there's with a the respect for the fact that it is science fiction. What are some of the things that you do wish they'd been able to incorporate that we've discovered since then? Um, I actually nothing really. I mean. When, when, I was, when, when I was working on Jurassic Park 1, Stephen and I had a lot of arguments about whether the Velociraptor should have feathers and be colorful. And he won all of those arguments. <laughs> he said a technicolor feathered dinosaur is not going to scare anyone. It's a fair concession. <laughs> so, so they're gray and you know featherless and scary. <laughs> I guess. Um, well, were there times that you were able to say, like, all right, that's not going to be scary, but let me tell you about this, and this is going to terrify people? Um, no. No? Okay. <laughs> all right, then. <laughs> um, um, so, obviously, you're a wealth of information for the filmmakers to come to. Um, what, were, what were some of the questions that they asked you that you were able to advise them on? There's a lot of, well, first off, my job really was to make sure that the, the dinosaurs looked as good as they could without feathers and, you know, color. Um, but looked as accurate as they could based on the science of the time. Now, remember that was 1992. And, and I think we did a pretty good job of that. But then, you know, Stephen took them and made an act, actors out of them and they, everything they do is fictional. I mean, they run too fast. They're, in many cases, you know, a little bigger than they should be, which, is not a bad thing because we actually know that dinosaurs grew through most of their lives. And so people are always gonna find bigger bigger T-Rexes and you know bigger everything. So that's not a big deal. But but my job was to make sure that the dinosaurs look good and then and then mostly just, you know, make sure that there were that things were accurate, as accurate as they could be, so that basically what he said is you didn't want third graders to send in nasty letters. <laughs> and so, so there was a there was a, a time when we were doing the kitchen scene, and there was some raptors that came in the kitchen, and you 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 all know that. And originally they were going to come in and flick their fork tongue around, and I said, you know, you, you cannot do that because they didn't have fork tongues. We know that for sure because if they did, they had would have had Jacobson's organ, and they don't have that. So we know that for sure. And so he said, all right, but we need that, we need something for that space. We need, you know, we've got that time limit, that time in the, in the movie, and so we have to have some. So we, uh, that's when we changed the, uh, the scene to them coming to the door and snorting and fogging up the window. And that took them, that basically, you know, that, that's the one thing that really sort of moved them away from being very reptilian looking to being warm blooded. The only warm-blooded animals can do that, so that was that was one thing I got in there that I was very happy about because he kept he told me when we first started he didn't want monsters, but I had to keep moving him away from monsters <laughs> because that's he that's really what he wanted. Monsters, but not just yeah. <laughs> um, so that's I mean that's a great example. But what are some of the other sort of uh, characteristics that we we can discover based on dinosaurs, sort of the, the discovering of their remains. 
um, you know, we can tell just on a basic level that like, oh, uh, herbivores and carnivores have different teeth. How do we kind of extrapolate their behavior patterns based on that, and what, what were you able to sort of? Well, you know, the, first off, the, the Alan Grant character, the reason that's, I, um, the, sort of the part that is based on him is his, you know, he's in, his, in the book and in the, in the movie, he's, he's this guy who studies dinosaur behavior in Montana. And, and so that's what, you know, Michael Crichton took from my books. And, and the behavior that we do, we actually were able to determine that dinosaurs cared for their young, brought food to the babies, uh, you know. And we did it all from looking at the geological evidence. I mean, we found baby dinosaur skeletons in nest-like structures, and it was the first time, you know, that had ever been seen. So, so you can do behavioral science on dinosaurs even though they're all dead. And the latest stuff we've been working on, and we, you can see it in the new movie, but it's very subtle. Um, a baby triceratops. There's some baby triceratops in the new, in the new movie, and it, and kids are riding them. <laughs> but you'll notice the horns actually curve backward. The horns of the babies curve backward, and um, and then. So what we know is that baby dinosaurs actually baby triceratops actually look different than adult triceratops. You know, babies grew, and as they grew, their horns cur actually arced backwards, and then when they re started to reach sexual maturity, they actually grew forward. And when they're sexually mature, their horns are straight forward. And so, uh, and that's how, that's one of the ways we know that they're very social animals, because we see the same thing in mammal in mammals and birds, we see it in us, right? We can always tell a juvenile from an adult, and we know that when they lose those juvenile characteristics, right, out the door they go and they have to get a job, <laughs> right? So, 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 you know, um, skeletal maturity, sexual maturity, these are all things that we can actually tell in the fossil record. So, we tried to get few of those things we can stick in the movie. I was going to say, I think, uh, is it a Pachycephalosaurus appears in uh, one of the films? And it's another one of the creatures that the, the dome-headed, right. uh, shifting kind of structure. They, they talk about them crashing their heads together. And we've actually proved that they could only do that once. <laughs> <laughs> so one so the two that are laying there, just remember, they, that was their first time. <laughs> only time. <laughs> Um, but it's great that sort of there's this, this element in that they do want to respect the kind of as much of the scientific right. integrity that they can. Um, so, so you mentioned the nesting sort of habits and like maternal paternal instinct. That's definitely also something that appears with right. the T Rexes and the previous films. Um, were you were you ever upset that the Mayasaur didn't get to appear in the no, films? That's it right. was in the book. <laughs> no, that's all right. Um, so can you can you you know can you talk about some of the other sort of contributions where you kind of got to say like, you, know, you mentioned the raptors, you mentioned the triceratops, what are some of the other ones where you just said like, we, you have to, well, like, there, let's respect know, the. <laughs> there's, not, there's not a lot of them because, you know, as we all know, there's not a lot of science actually shown. I mean, the dinosaurs basically are chasing somebody. I mean, the plant eaters are eating plants or, <laughs> Or standing around waiting to get eaten by something else. Since they are getting eaten, yes, that's true. <laughs> yeah. There's just there, you know, we just don't see a lot of the behavioral stuff. Or, um, there was one interesting thing um, in the first movie. I think it was the first. It might have been the second one. Anyway, um, we have a dinosaur pie, right? A dinosaur heap of dung, and. And it looked like elephant dung. And I said, you know, we can't look like elephant dung. It's got to look like bird poo, right? So it can't be just a bunch of bally looking things. It actually has to be a big white thing. We went round and round about that. <laughs> <laughs> they won. <laughs> I don't know if it's a, a battle you necessarily always want to pick. Um, well, you know, that, yeah. that dinosaur, that you know, as long as you don't have to handle it, I it defi <laughs> it defies the dung law, the the one that's in the movie. You know, a pile of dung should never be any higher than the place it came from. 
good, good to remember. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, sort of speaking of the actual remains and not not that type of remains, but um, there there you know there's not a ton of science mentioned in the movie, but the the originals you know we he extracts the DNA from a mosquito, but we know that like it, the the biomaterial wouldn't actually hold up. But you guys have actually been able to extract material from fossils. Yep. Um, could you yep. talk a little bit maybe about B. rex? <laughs> yeah, B. rex is a, well, it, well, it used to be a very special dinosaur um, until just very recently. Um, it was a dinosaur, it's a Tyrannosaurus rex, and it was found under a thousand cubic yards of rock. And it produced soft tissues, clear, flexible blood vessels that we were able to etch out of the internal structure, uh, internal parts of the bone. And we also were able to get collagen, the protein collagen, and we were able to get cells with nuclei. And unfortunately, no DNA. The DNA had broken down. But what we've learned since then is that, that these soft tissues will preserve and they're, their fixing agent is iron. Um, but what's interesting is, you know, when we think about a fossil, a dinosaur, or any animal that dies, and when it dies, it begins to rot. And it rots because bacteria gets in there and starts feeding on it. But if bacteria can't get into it, and your fixing agent is quick enough, which is iron, of course, iron is, you know, heme is the, is the basis of hemoglobin, and it's already in the vessels. And so your fixing agent is already there. And what we've discovered is that these tissues, as long as they don't get broken down by bacteria right away, will actually last forever, clear and flexible, which is pretty cool. And it's you know changed our whole notion of what fossilization is, because you can be fossilized and still be flexible. Um, yeah, it's, it's just chemistry. That's what you have to remember. It's just chemistry. Easy, easy chem. No, <laughs> um, no, but it's great. I mean, I suppose theoretically, if he'd written the book today, you know, he could instead of a mosquito, it'd be a femur bone. Um, That's right. Yeah. Um, which, but kind no of, DNA. But no DNA. Um, but it does bring us to kind of another thing that you're working on that kind of is taking the fiction part out of, out of science fiction. <laughs> um, and that's the chickenosaurus and building a dinosaur. Um, you know, it's, it's definitely something that I could see the fictional John Hammond dreaming up, but would you mind telling us about how to build the dinosaur? All right, well, so the, the premise behind all of this was, you know, Jurassic Park was trying to bring dinosaurs back and, and we know we can't do that. We, I have tried many times to extract DNA from a dinosaur and we've al always failed. And it's probably, we think, because the DNA molecule is huge and it just is not very stable. It breaks down very quickly and so it just comes apart too easily. And even the mammoth elephant that's 10,000 years old, they have fragments of DNA but they're tiny. They're just only a few hundred base pair. And that's only 10,000 years and so, you know, even if we got DNA, even if we found some fragments that were still together from a dinosaur, they'd still probably only be in the tens of base pair. So we know we're never going to make a dinosaur that way. So, you know, birds are living dinosaurs. They are dinosaurs. And so, and so they carry dinosaur DNA, obviously, since they are dinosaurs. And but when you look at a bird and you look at a dinosaur, if you look at especially at their skeletons, you know, the, the, uh, the skeleton of a bird, chicken, uh, has no tail, it has wings, has no teeth, it's got this beak, and, you know, looks like chicken. <laughs> but, and it is a dinosaur, you know, and I keep trying to tell the sixth graders it's a dinosaur, and they just, you know, say it's not cool enough looking, so. So, so to make a cool bird into a di you know make a cool dinosaur, um, what we're doing now is looking for atavistic genes. In other words, ancestral genes that the birds might still be carrying that are just turned off. Right? They 
So to lose the tail, in other words, when we went from Archaeopteryx-like animals with long tails to any bird we have now that has a short tail, there is a genetic pathway that's missing, right? And so we're looking for those historical genetic pathways to reinstate them. And so we're going in and actually going into an embryo and, and determining when particular genes are turned on, at what stage of their development they're turned on, and when they're turned off, and, and trying to adjust those so that we can actually get a bird to hatch out with a long tail. Um, so teeth, so we, we have these four, four things. There's teeth, the beak, uh, the snout, making it, changing it, the tail, and the arms and hands. And teeth were accomplished uh, back in the 90s. Um, there's a, a group at the University of Wisconsin that actually was able to turn a gene on and without adding anything to a bird, get chickens to have teeth. Now they're first generation teeth. They couldn't actually grow through the keratin of the beak. So they're just, they're implanted in the jaw, but you know, we have them. So we know that all we have to do is knock out the, uh, the uh, uh, keratin to get it to come through. Just a few weeks ago, a group at Harvard and Yale were able to transform the beak into a mouth that looks like a dinosaur. And that, you know, that actually is proof of concept. That was a atavistic gene that they actually turned on and changed the form of its mouth. We are working on the tail, which is the hardest part because we actually, in order to in order to get a tail to grow, we actually are going to have to add vertebrae. We can, we, we, have, we have gone in and found the atavistic gene. We can get it to produce about 14 vertebrae, um, which is sort of an ancestral state, but is basically what a bird already has, except they fuse the end of it together to make what, they call, what we call a pygostyle. We can, we can s sort of sort those out right now, but it's still not a long tail. So what we're, we're working on now is actually trying to figure out how to put basically an alligator-like tail on a bird. And, and we're making good progress. We've, we've actually done it a couple of times, but we can't really, we've had some problems. We can't, we, we can't tell whether we've added tail or changed the position of the pelvis. So in the embryo, you know, everything's done at very small states, and so it's just hard to tell where we are right now. But, and the hand, actually going back to a, a hand, transforming it back from a wing, we don't think will be too much difficulty because it really is just a matter of, it's, it's a gene that fuses the three digits together, and we just have to unfuse them, and we think that'll be a relatively easy process. But the tail is the big the big thing, because as soon as we can add vertebrae, I mean, it has just tremendous uh, application to the medical field. And I mean, there's just so many things that we'll be able to do, but it is the most complex. But right now, figure teeth and the mouth, that's 50%. We're halfway there. <laughs> Hopefully halfway, not to the doctors running around. But, and you but we make them one at a time. <laughs> <laughs> right. I think they'd have a hard time out in the wild trying to find another chickenosaurus to mate with. <laughs> and if they did mate, you know, you're just going to have chickens. <laughs> and they're only going to like chicken food. Chicken there we food. Go. Yeah. Um, but you, you do sort of mention in your book, you know, it's not going to be Jurassic Park as yeah. much as some of us might want our own pet raptor. Um, but it's version one, right? Right. It's the first version. So when we make a dino chicken, I mean, that is the first version, and then we, you know, by then we will know, uh, know enough about different genes that we might be able to, you know, version two could look an awful lot, an awful lot closer to a <laughs> velociraptor. There you go. Um, but, it, but it was an interesting thing. Um, you know, it's still, it's never going to be, we're never going to have a velociraptor. We're, ne we're going to have a 
version of the ancestral you know, qualities of it, but that's something I think they, a few of the characters actually express in Jurassic Park. So they go, no, these aren't dinosaurs. These right. are whatever things you've mixed with them to bring that's dinosaurs right. to life. So it's And that is why we have Indominus Rex. The, the super amazing badass Indominus Rex. Exactly, yes. Um, which we won't which too much away about. <laughs> which is actually the most plausible thing that we've made in Jurassic Park so far. Think about that. <laughs> it is, we know that we can't get dinosaurs back from DNA, right? But we can make a hybrid. I mean, we make transgenic animals right now. Um, we definitely change, you know, we, we genetically engineer all sorts of things. I mean, if you, all these funny little dog chihuahuas, you know, I mean, they are genetically modified wolves. That's what they are. And so breeding is one of the, you know, biological modification tools that we use to change how an animal looks already. And then transgenic engineering, which an example is making glowfish. So you take genes out of a, a jellyfish and stick them in a, you know, zebra fish and make them glow. And now we know that we can do that with anything. I mean, you can, you can do it with a human if you wanted to. I mean, seriously, you just stick it in the embryo, and so we've got glowing, we've got glow-in-the-dark cats, rabbits, you know, you name it. You can make anything glow-in-the-dark by doing transgenic engineering. And that's the whole idea of Indominus Rex is, is to make it, it's just basically a genetic transgenic hybrid, which we already know how to do. So if we could get dinosaurs back, we could make Indominus Rex. I think that would have a lot more consequences than any of us <laughs> want to happen. But um, no, it's I, I won't spoil it for people who haven't seen it yet. Um, you know, it's it is sort of this thing. You know, they they say in the that they mix it with tree frogs. Your uh, the the DNA with tree frogs. You know, we're talking about engineering a chicken dinosaur like non avian. Mm -hmm. um, so what's where do you see the future of the field going? The like feature of oh, paleontology. Feature of paleontology. <laughs> Only because it, it, you know, it's it's evolved in the sense that like it used to be, oh, preserve, you know, right. you, we want things for museums. Now it's like let's cut it open and let's see what's inside. That's right. That's what we do. Yes. Um, so we will continue to cut things open and learn all sorts of new things. As far as you know, our genetic engineering efforts. You know, I as wacky and wild as it sounds, I mean. We could start making some, you know, I keep, you know, I throw this out. So since we can make glow-in-the-dark animals, we could actually make a glow-in-the-dark unicorn. <laughs> Why not, right? Why not? A unicorn would actually be, <laughs> a unicorn would actually be easier than a dino chicken. I mean, <laughs> it's just a horse with a <laughs> thing on his head, right? And, and it turns out there's actually, there are actually, um, ossicones on, or even giraffes. If you ever look at a giraffe really close, it actually has a horn in the middle. It's a horny structure, and and you yeah, know it's well modifiable. So, so I actually think we could make a unicorn pretty easily. And that would make a lot of and make it glow in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> As if one feature wasn't good enough, let's make it glow in the dark. So the chicken source, like you mentioned before, it, it's not just about that. It, it, the discovery involved in, especially like the tail thing, it involves a lot of the spine, involves a lot of um, sort of discovering at what points in development do these things happen. Um, could you talk a little bit about the more about the applications to yeah, the, us, well, you us know, bipeds? <laughs> it's, it, there, I don't know. Everyone's worried about the application. You know, why go? Why make it dino chicken? Well, you know. I don't think I have to say that to everybody in here, actually. I think all of you know why we want a dino chicken, right? Because it's going to be fun. I mean, <laughs> that's just all, it's all there is to it. And all the kids are going to like it. But there's a lot of, you know, people who are grown-ups that always say, what good is it? What would you do it for? Well, you know, as I was saying, you know, learning how, learning what different genes do and how to turn them on and how to turn them off has huge application in the medical field. And so, you know, and quite frankly, you know, genetics is extremely boring, and nobody wants, you know, nobody ever goes to college to 
study genetics that I can I can imagine. I mean, it's just awful. So, so at least if you thought you could make a dino chicken, you know, it'd be sound, sounds like it'd be pretty interesting. So, you know, if you can think start thinking about making new kinds of animals, rather than you know bigger tomatoes, you know, it's it's at least a good way to get kids interested in a pretty boring science. <laughs> I'm not going to go so far as to call it boring, but oh. I, just, I, I do think it gives, you know, it's an interesting, tangible, visible presentation of these are some applications of it. Think of what you could do. Think of you could have your own glow-in-the-dark unicorn That's right. someday. Um, or a yeah. glow-in-the-dark dino chicken. Even better. Uh, do we have any questions? Do you want to come up to the mic? <laughs> Uh, hello, I'm Alex. Um, I'm kind of curious to, to know your thoughts on the usage of this genetic research uh, in animal conservation, considering the northern black rhino just last week went extinct. Um, do you, has there been any kind of like conference between your research groups and other research groups in animal conservation to, to use this uh, developing technology to, to preserve these genes in a, a very uh, precise manner so that maybe in the future with technologi uh, technological increase we can bring these animals that we had alive back from extinction? Thank you. Uh, they, okay, uh, de-extinction is a wholly different thing. Um, de-extinction, the de then there are a lot of de-extinction projects going on right now. They're trying to get the passenger pigeon back. They're trying to get the, you know, the uh, Tasmanian wolf back. Um, they're trying to get the mammoth elephant back. All of which were probably wiped out by humans. Uh, the dodo bird, we know, I don't know if we need a dodo, but, <laughs> but, <laughs> but uh, de-extinction, in order to get them back, does require DNA, and it requires enough to put it, to inject in the cell and, and make an animal such as a, as, as a mammoth elephant which is pretty plausible. Um, it's pretty plausible because we have elephants. So, so the chances are pretty good if we have a, a, a chunk of DNA, at least a pretty good chunk of one, and then we add it to elephant DNA, we're going to get some kind of a hairy elephant of some sort. With the rhino, actually, we have their complete DNA, and we have it preserved. So as soon as we figure out how to clone DNA, we can do that. But right now what we would end up doing is taking that complete strand of DNA and sticking it in one of the non-extinct rhinos, and it still would be some kind of combination. And that's the problem. We don't, we, we rely right now on, on a cloning technology that involves a particular kind of cell from a particular kind of animal. And we don't know how to take an individual strand of DNA and make it make something. We don't know how to do that yet. But when we can, then we can, we could probably bring back a number of things that are going extinct. But it breaks down too quick, so going back and sort of bringing things back from very deep time is going to be impossible. And I mean impossible, not maybe someday. It's just because you're never going to get a s complete strand of DNA from anything much older than even probably a few hundred years. Hi, thanks for coming in. Um, I did wanted to add a comment first about um, glowing unicorns, glow-in-the-dark unicorns. We have the same kind of problem in computer science where it can seem really dull to get people interested in it, especially um, in ads. So we have um, <laughs> <laughs> so we have machine learning to kind of you know uh -huh. excite people, artificial intelligence, the thought of potentially you know robots right. in, in the future. So that's our glowing unicorn equivalent in our mm -hmm. field. Um, I was wondering. So when I was growing up, um, the the science at the time was saying that there was a big uh, extinction event uh, involving dinosaurs, but I've heard more recently that maybe it wasn't extinction at all, maybe it was just evolution. Um, what's the, like, what's, well, the, what's the consensus there, there, now there really, there really was a big extinction event. Okay. Um, 
I downplay it myself. Um, at the end of most museum exhibits, there's you know a big thing about the meteor coming down and killing everything off, and I just have a bird exhibit. <laughs> you know, I I just basically don't think about extinction because you know we cla we're we classify animals, right? So we put them in the categories, and then we say, oh, look at that category, it goes extinct, and you know it's just. Birds are just fine, and birds are dinosaurs, so it seems kind of weird. But, but, uh, but no, but all, so we separate them now into non-avian dinosaurs and avian dinosaurs. So all birds are avian dinosaurs, and all the ones that went extinct are non-avian dinosaurs. And non-avian dinosaurs did go extinct by some catastrophic event, probably, although Might be some hiding out in Africa. <laughs> <laughs> um, with this kind of research, you always have people who have ethical quandaries regarding this kind of um, development over time. What would you say to people who have these kind of ethical quandaries about how this could be applied medically or to people or bad ethics. science kind of things? Ethics. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I was just in London a few days ago and there was someone who stood up and was very adamant about talking about where you draw a line. And I was thinking, you know, that it's, a, it's an odd question. And it's an odd question to a scientist because you know, we have no way of figuring out where to draw a line. I mean, it's, lines are personal preference. I mean, I, I think science, I think scientists need to discover everything it's possible to discover. Now. A lot of it might have bad consequences, but if if we draw a line and say, okay, we're not going to study this particular thing, but somebody in some other country doesn't have that same line and they make something that's, you know, dangerous to us, but we've never figured out a way to deal with it, we're done. So, you know, we need, I think we need to learn how to do everything. And when it comes to these animals, I mean, again, Nobody drew a line and said, oh, we shouldn't make a chihuahua. <laughs> but, you know, somebody could have. I mean, it's just, I, I just don't think there's, I don't think there's any particular reason to draw any kind of a line like that. But that's my personal preference. Also, doesn't a lot of it get sort of sensationalized? Like, we, we test on mice. We test, we test it on fruit flies, not the fruit flies and mice are necessarily the same thing. But we are doing sort of experimentation well, on all sorts. We're always experimenting on animals. Absolutely, and plants. I mean, everything. There is drawing a line is it's just a, it's an interesting concept. So you mentioned that uh, if you took two dino chickens and mated them, you would get a chicken. So right. I'm guessing that you are altering just the expression of genes by right. chemicals in the embryo, not their DNA. That's not correct. their DNA. Have you considered? Okay, well we're going to take the DNA that we know in an alligator makes the tail splice it in and then, hey, we'd actually have two dino chickens that right. would make dino chickens right. or whatever else. Yeah, no, I, um, I would, once we sort of have some idea of how to make a dino chicken, um, I, they're kind of a pain in the butt to, you know, to make one at a time, so if we could change their DNA, that'd be good. You know, we could make them, you know, so they make themselves. So I guess as a consultant on the Jurassic Park films, you have a lot of insight into how the movie world portrays dinosaurs. Uh, do you think in general, movies have been good for the paleontology industry and getting people excited about it? Or do you think it's had a lot of negative consequences by the way that it portrays them maybe wrongly? No, I, I don't think it has any negative at all. I mean, that when I, in 19, 93 when Jurassic Park came out before Jurassic Park 1 came out I had I don't know three graduate students guys three graduate student guys when Jurassic Park came out just after it came out I had and I had I had incredible numbers of people trying to get into the program I ended up with 18 almost instantly and it was 50 50 women and guys, so 
I know what that what that movie did, and it you know, no one was talking about you know the dinosaurs not having feathers. <laughs> <laughs> we have time for one more question. Do you have any sense of uh, how small the population of dinosaurs survived the potential extinction event that led to modern birds? Actually, the the animals that led to modern birds were doing very well early on. Uh, it wasn't the extinct one. It wasn't a group of extinct dinosaurs. Well, that's not the right way to put it. Uh, birds evolved back in the in the Jurassic period, long before the extinction, and so they were actually doing pretty well. And and a lot of obviously a lot of birds went extinct as well, uh, but but um, obviously the the ones that made it through the the little what. They were all little birds, probably robin-sized things uh, that we have very little fossil record of, um, are the ones that gave rise to basically all of the birds that we have now. Okay, thank but, you. But they had, they were very far along. One of the things that's really hard to imagine is just the amount of time that's involved. You know, from the late Jurassic to the extinction period of time, is is more time than has existed since the extinction of dinosaurs until now. So, I mean, you just have these you know, huge spans of time to evolve all sorts of things. I have a new dinosaur I'm trying to name right now, and it's got some weird characteristics. I think its, it's head is full of these incredible um, nerve bundles and there's no animal on this earth that looks anything like this. And I mean, there's not even a, a good way to guess what this animal was doing unless it was telepathic. I mean, it's just really odd characteristics. And we see this in a lot of these dinosaurs. I mean, it's just, they just had so long to evolve. They, they've got these things that, these characteristics that are so different than animals alive today. And that's why you know, you can make all kinds of stuff for Jurassic Park. I mean, we could just come up with wild, crazy ideas, even for ones that probably did exist, let alone the ones that we can manufacture. Dinosaurs are cool. <laughs> Dinosaurs are very cool. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. You're welcome. And yeah, thanks. <laughs> Let's give a round of applause. <laughs>